good morning, everyone. It is so good to be with you today, beginning this brand new series called Rebirth. Excited to jump into it. Now, I'm going to start off with a bit of a trivia question, and it's going to be a bit of a trivia trick question at the start. But I don't know if this has ever come up in any trivia that you've done or in any of those any of those kinds of questions. But the man-made things, man-made buildings that can be seen from space. Do you know what they are? Put them into the comments. If you know what any man-made structures are that can be seen from space. I want you to start thinking about those and put them down. Humans love building stuff. We love building things. We love putting things together. We love putting things out there. We love creating. We love building tall structures. We love all of those kinds of things. What are some of those things that you think can be seen from space? Now, of course, being seen from space, it's it's kind of... Um, it, well, it really depends because it depends on how far into space you are. There's some people putting things in the putting things in the uh, in the comments already, and it depends on how far you are. Now they say the experts say that space or the atmosphere between you know the Earth's atmosphere and space is about 100 kilometers above above the Earth, about 100 k's up. That's when you enter into kind of space. And of course, if you're at 100 k's, you're going to be able to see things a lot more clearly, or you're going to see things a lot more closer than if you're 1,000 kilometers up into space. So it kind of depends, but there are a couple of things. Yeah. And yes, for those of you who've said um, the Great Pyramids of Giza, you are correct. They can be seen from space. The Palm Islands, you know those islands in Dubai that are shaped like palm trees? They can be seen from space as well. Um, there's also something else, are the greenhouses in Almeria in Spain, 230 kilometers of greenhouses, 230 kilometers squared of greenhouses, white plastic that can be seen from space. They call it the plastic sea. And so you can see that from space. Now, one of the other ones that's a bit of a, uh, a misconception is that you can see the Great Wall of China from Spain. Now, I'm uh, from Spain. I don't think, man, if you can see the Great Wall of China from Spain, you, you are a very, very talented human being. And X-ray vision, tell us how that you've, you've achieved that, that, that lofty height. You can, you know, people say you can see the Great Wall of China from space. Now, in 2003, they sent up the first Chinese astronaut into space. And they said, how was it? How was the, how was the Great Wall? He said, the scenery is very beautiful but I did not see the wall. That's right, you can't actually see the Great Wall of China from space. It's too hard to pick out amongst everything else. So if you've ever answered that in a trivia question and it's been marked right, well, you've got a, you've got away with one there because you can't actually see it from space. But we love building things and there are those kinds of things that we want to build up into space as though we could reach the heavens. And that's what's going to bring us to our passage today in Genesis chapter 11. So I want you to open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 11, because we're going to look at a passage here, a group of people who decide to build a tower that's going to reach the heavens, build a tower that's going to go all the way into space. We're starting this series called Rebirth, where we're going to look into some of the vices or those the things that have been classically known as the seven deadly sins and also their corresponding virtues. The seven deadly sins have been around for, um, for a thousand, over a thousand years, maybe 1500 years. 1500 years, yes. And so that's so, and they form the way that we've thought about the flesh, what the Bible calls the flesh, our sin nature, the, the, the part of our lives that's kind of that's, that's waging warfare against our new nature in Christ. But then also, we we'll want to invite us to the virtues that come through life in Christ. And so that's where we're going with this so that we can move into freedom together. And so this is in Genesis chapter 11. I'm going to read the entire passage. Then we're going to work through it. and We're going to make some observations as we begin to talk about pride. Title of the message today is called Head Down, Hands Up. Title of the message, Head Down, Hands Up. I want you to write that at the top of your page. Remember that. Put it in your notes. Head Down, Hands Up as we look at this passage Today. Now, Genesis chapter 11, starting at verse 1, says this. Now, the whole earth 
had one language and the same words. As in they all spoke in one tribal language. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let's make bricks. Let's burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, bitumen for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. We're going to build something, guys, that's going to be seen from space. We're going to build ourselves a city with its top reaching up into the heavens. You've got to remember, in, the, in this time, the ancients believed that heaven was above and that earth was where we lived and that hell was below. And they saw it in these very three clearly spatial dimensions. And so they said, we're going to build this tower and it's going to take us from earth. It's going to take us up into heaven. Let's build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. Let's make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people. They have one language. This is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing they propose to do now will be impossible for them. So come, let's go down, confuse their language so that they may not be able to understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of the earth, and they left off building the city. So therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of the earth. Okay, crazy story, wild story from way back in the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 11. This passage of scripture actually finds itself in what they call prehistory. So the commentators would say that this is in the primeval time of scripture. So you can accurately date from Abraham, about 2000 years BC. Abraham happens just after this in the, in the biblical record. He follows in, in Genesis chapter 12, but here, this is, the, this is called prehistory. Now, you can't reliably kind of date this this time. And now I'm sure I'm going to get emails about that. So just send them straight through. All good. But Abraham happens, Genesis chapter 11, about 2000 years BC. And so these stories, this prehistory, make up the fabric. They're the origin stories of planet Earth. They're the origin stories of who we are as the people of God. The origin stories of God's interaction interaction with humankind throughout history that would play itself out many, many times. But here we have some of these initial and early stories. Now, what we have here is this group of people who are on a journey. They've been coming from the east. They're moving because in Genesis chapter 9, God spoke to Noah and he renewed his covenant with Noah there. And he said, be fruitful and multiply. It's the same thing that he told Adam and Eve in the garden. Be fruitful and multiply and spread across the whole earth. Take the blessing that you have and spread it across the entire earth. And that was the mandate. That was the call that was given to the people of God to go, to spread, to be fruitful, to multiply. And then what we have here in Genesis chapter 11 is a stop to all of that, where they get to Shinar and they go, I reckon this is good. Let's just, this, let's just call it good here. Sounds like me going for a run. I'm going to go for a 3K run. I get to the end of my street and go, no, I'm, I'm happy. I'm good. I think I'll just turn around and go back, call home, walk home. It's a warm down, right? So they go and they get to a point and then they stop. Everything calls and stops to a halt right here. You have a plan and a purpose for your life. God has spoken to you. When you say, God, what is the will for my life? Be fruitful, multiply, spread, go on a journey with him. Live into the story that he's written for you. Don't stop now. God wants you to go. He's got you on a journey. It's why Jesus said, come follow me. Follow. It's a journey. He's inviting you on a journey. It was the original intention and is still the intention today. 
So the ancients said, no, they get to this place. They said, we're going to build a city and we're going to build a tower. It is going to go up. Ziggurat. Basically, have you ever seen one of those, one of those old photos of like stairs? A big stairway, basically, that goes all the way up to heaven. They think, instead of going out any further, we'll call it good. We've had enough. We don't want to journey forever. Let's just stop here. Let's get settled and let's kind of lock down. And so that is what they do. The word Babel, they get to this place and they call this tower, they call this city Babel because it means literally the gate of God, right? The gate of God. How good is that? They're going to build this city and they're going to go, man, this tower is going to be so huge. It's going to get up to, it's going to, get up to heaven. People are going to come here from everywhere and they're going to say, this is the gate of God. Where, where do I find God? Well, I just go to that tower because it actually will take me there, right? They're going to call it the gate of God. And what we find here is that this pride is driven by two things. Now, this pride, which is not just here in this passage, but this passage is here to read us like a mirror. This pride that's here and that's also in your heart and that's also in my heart is driven by two Two things, and they're two things that are clearly seen in this passage. The pride that says, no, I'm not going to listen to God's intention for my life anymore. I know he wants me to go. I know he wants me to be a blessing. I know he wants me to go out, but no, I'm going to call it good. I'm just going to stay here and I'm just going to kind of bunker down and, and, and I'm going to kind of do my own thing and not listen to that call anymore. It's driven by two things. Those two things are this. The first one is the need for glory. They say to make a name for ourselves. And the second one is the need for comfort. We have this insatiable desire for comfort. And the need for glory and the need for comfort are the two things that are going to stop you from fulfilling the the call and the mission of God on your life. It was the two things that stopped these people here from going, from being fruitful and multiplying and stopped them in the city and where they would stop to build a city and go, no, that's good. Let's just build a tower to God. And then everyone's going to talk about how good we are. We need, we, you know, we, we, we're driven for a, a need for glory because we, we, we are un, we're insecure and we're uncertain and we don't know and we just want, we want to feel good about ourselves and so we get driven for this, this sense that we need to make a name for ourselves but also because life is so uncertain, we're driven for, by, by comfort. We need a, a sense of security, a sense of something tangible to be able to hold on to and these two things are the seat of pride in your life and in mine. So whenever you start to feel proud, it's either a need for name, a need for glory, an insatiable desire to be known, or a need for comfort to be able to grab onto something in this crazy, uncertain world that we live in. And they say it here, right here in verse 4, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, And let us make a name for ourselves. So the question I want to ask you today is whose name are you making great in your life? Whose name are you making great? Now, before you say, oh, yeah, of course, I'm not about myself. I'm about others. Or before you say, oh, yeah, of course, I'm not about myself. I'm about God. You don't have to be flashy. You don't have to be making millions and millions of dollars. You don't have to own multiple houses. You don't have to have the best car in order to make a name for myself. Because I tell you, the most proud people that I know are people on a modest income, modest wage, modest car. But in that, they feel like they've done something valuable and that they've provided for themselves and therefore they're somebody of worth because they've done these kinds of things. You can be modest and still proud. You can have modest things and still have pride in your heart if that's what you're if that's what you're staking your claim on, on being somebody of worth, on a value. I want to tell you today, this is where religion gets in the way because this is where the Pharisees got in the way. They said, well, I fulfill all of of the commands. I do everything here that I need. And so therefore, I'm good to go. I've made a name for myself by just being righteous and holy. God says, no. Look at the tax collector who beats his breast and says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. He's the one who goes home justified before God because he knows he's got 
nothing. He's not interested in making a name for himself. He's interested in laying himself upon the mercy of God. And today, I want to tell you that this idea of making a name for myself, of being known for somebody who's self-reliant, of being known for somebody who's got it all together, that's where pride sets in. That's saying, I'm going to make a name for myself. That's building a tower. And just because you don't think, oh, I'm not building a massive tower up to the heavens, I'm just building a little three, three story tower. It's still a tower. It's still a gate of God that you're trying to access glory through. And that's what God wants to politely and humbly and beautifully and mercifully address in your heart and in my heart today. It's driven by the name for, by need for a name and a need for comfort. You see that there? Let's make a name for ourselves, they say in verse 4, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. They're saying, we don't want to be spread out over the whole earth. We don't want to be keep on walking. We don't want to keep on journeying. We need to stop at some point and just pull in the reins and make a city and build a tower and just call it a day. Let's call it good. Now that call for comfort in your life and in mine will do exactly the same thing because it's exactly what God didn't want them to do. He hasn't created them for that. He's created them to be fruitful multiply, be a blessing, take the blessing of God and spread it around and share it around. And they're like, man, this blessing stuff and working for serving others, man, it's hard work. We should just need to make a city and build a tower and, 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 and then at least we'll be comfortable. At least we'll know, you know, gee, if the storm comes, we won't be out in the, it won't be out in the wild. If rain comes, at least we'll be covered. It's going to be good if we stay, if we keep it like this, lest we be dispersed. Whereas God's saying, that's what I'm trying to do with you. I'm trying to disperse you. I'm trying to take you out. And yet the same, so that drive for comfort in our lives will work actively against the call of God because I can guarantee you the call of God in your life is going to make you uncomfortable. I can guarantee it. The call of God on your life is going to make you uncomfortable. When Jesus got into the boat with the disciples and he said, throw your nets over for a catch. He, they've caught so many fish, it made their fishing trip uncomfortable. The blessing, the level of impact, the level of fruitfulness meant that they had to make some changes. It's the same with your life and in mine. When Jesus gets into your boat, he makes things uncomfortable for you and that's how he wants it because it's not about you it's about him anyway right so he's working against actively working against your comfort sometimes I know which sounds crazy because in this day in this time we've been told that God exists and he exists to make your life awesome and here he doesn't make he doesn't exist to make your life awesome your life is awesome by following after the call the plan the purpose and the and the, and in obedience following after the heart of god to be a blessing to your neighbors let that sink in for a moment jesus himself sought to forego his comfort in order that he would obey the father and be a blessing to you and to me by his death and resurrection. Now I love this. The next part of this passage, it brings in some humor. There's a bit of a there's a funny here if you if you're um, if you've got eyes to see it. So they say let's build ourselves a city. We're going to build a tower with its top in the heavens so um, so that we can make a name for ourselves and so that we, so that we don't get dispersed over the earth. And then in verse 5, it says the Lord came down to see the city. <laughs> The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. So they've gone, we're going to make this massive tower. It's going to be huge, guys. Top in the heavens. It's going to be the best. And then God's like, looking from space, right? I don't see it. Hold on, let's go a bit closer. Comes down. Still don't see it. Goes a bit closer. Still doesn't see it. He has to get right up on it before he even sees what they've built. And they've thought it's huge. They've thought it's massive. God comes down. He can't see it from there. He's got to come down and see it. So it's a, it's a comedic way of saying, guys, what you think you're building is actually really small in comparison to who God is. He has to travel all the way. You may you inconvenience him to get out of, the, out of off the throne to come down and see what it is that you think you've built that you think is so great. He's got to come all this way to see it. 
And see, this is what happens with us in our pride. It's, it's, it's self-justifying. When you find yourself self-justifying all the time, that's when pride's getting, oh, the reason that that happened is because of this. The reason that it happened is not because of me, it's because of somebody else. The reason that that happened, you know, because oh, our tower is so big and yet God's going to come down and try and see this thing. He's kind of squinting his eyes. I still can't get it, guys. He's going to come down and see it. If you know that there's pride in your heart when you're self-justifying like that, when you're always blaming others, oh, the reason that that happens is because of them. It's because of them. It's because of that. It's because of this reason. It's never because of me because my tower is huge. And yet at the same time, when God looks at it in context, there is so much more going on. You know that you've got pride when it's hard for you to celebrate the successes of others. Because every single time somebody else succeeds, we see that as a threat, right? When somebody else succeeds or gets a job you were going for or gets a relationship that you, you, that you feel like you deserve or gets a pay rise at you or whatever it might be or it has a small success with their family or their kids and you think, oh, that should have happened to me. That's a, anyone else's success now becomes a threat. That's what, that's where pride sits in our heart because it, it, it's an affront to our need to make a name for ourselves, our need to have comfort and security. And so those kinds of things get in there. We think our tower is so great. Oh, my tower is so huge. Look at all the things that I've got. Look at my house or look at my, look at my online following or look at my f- beautiful family or look at my, my spirituality, whatever it is. God's going to come down to see it because it's so small. Pride also says, well, here's what I know and just locks itself onto my current level of knowledge and my current level of insight. And if it's something that I don't understand, that it mustn't be true. It mustn't be true when someone else, someone brings a new idea and you're like, well, it can't be true because here's what I know right now. And it's a fixed mindset like that. It's a prideful mindset. Now we move on to the next part here where God comes down to see the city which the children of man had built. And God said, behold, they're one people. They have one language. This is only the beginning of what they'll do. Man, if they've disobeyed me by going, like just in this, this is the beginning of what they'll do. The the disobedience is just going to ramp up to a whole new level. So he says, "Um, this is nothing they propose will be impossible. Come, let's go down and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of the earth. They were left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel. So what happens here in the Hebrew The word Babel for gate of God sounds very similar to the word confusion. And so what God does here in his grace is takes their gate of God and calls it a confusing lie. He says they haven't built a gate of God. What they've built is confusion. And so he confuses their speech. And so they now live in this place, live in the midst of their disobedience. But God still disperses them across the earth. So God calls their gate of God a confusing gate. Babel means gate of God, but God calls it confusion. So what we call the gate of God in pride, what we call our greatest accomplishments, what we call our biggest towers, what we call our greatest successes. And we say, by this, by this, we are somebody of substance. By this, I'm somebody of value. By this, I'm somebody who's meant to be known and loved and respected. By this, I will have comfort and security in my days. God is confused and he calls that a confusion. He doesn't call that a gate of God. He calls that confusion. When you build a tower to your own greatness, listen to me now. When you build a tower to your own greatness, you might just find yourself working against God himself. Because God's design is for you to go. Is for your name to not be in yourself, but to make his name great. For your comfort to not be in yourself, but in the eternal security that comes by resting in the hands of God. Humility says, I'm sorry. Humility takes responsibility and says, well, maybe I've contributed to this. Humility rejoices 
in the accomplishments of others. Humility says, what can I learn rather than, well, I don't understand and therefore it's wrong. Our gate of God, our greatest accomplishments are at risk of being called confusion if we put our trust in them. We put our trust in those things. And so we see it in verse 9. Therefore, its name was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of the people. And from there, God dispersed them over the face of the earth. So here's the thing. What they failed to do in their disobedience, God did in his judgment. So they were meant to go in obedience. They were meant to scatter across the earth, take the blessing of God, be fruitful, multiply, do all of those kinds of things. And they refused to do it. So what they, what they did not do in their obedience... God did in his judgment. So he still had his way. God's plan and purpose still moved forward, except they didn't experience it as the merciful, kind hand of God. They experienced it as the judgmental hand of God on them as he dispersed them anyway. So this is the thing. God, we, we, when we, they were working against God, when God said go, what they would not do in obedience, God did in his judgment. So I want to tell you today to keep your head down, but keep your hands up. Keep your head down, but keep your hands up. Keep your head down, stay humble, work hard, stay focused, stay supple in your spirit to what it is that God's doing. Stay postured towards him in a place of humility, but keep your hands up. Give the glory to God. Worship him and serve him. Surrender to him. Open your hands to him and open your hands to others. Give as you have freely received. Continue to give. Go with him when he tells you to go. Otherwise, you'll find yourself working against him. Live into those things that he's called you to live into rather than just stopping and either making a name for yourself or just bringing comfort to yourself. God judged Jesus, you see, and his obedience is now ours. Our disobedience, our pulling the reins in, our making a name for ourselves, our insatiable desire for comfort and security, Jesus took that upon himself. And in his obedience and in his discomfort, you and I have an invitation to life. Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done. Philippians says that, that Jesus himself, even though he was in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing being found in human likeness. He became obedient to death, even death on a cross. So by his obedience, you and I are saved. By his obedience, you and I can be a blessing. By his discomfort, you and I can go and be a blessing, bring life and light to the world around us, to our neighbours, both near and far. By his humility, we have an invitation to be humble. Because at the end of the day, his word over your life is the most important. He died for you so you are valuable. He holds you in his hand after the resurrection and ascension, which means you are safe and you are secure. He has the final word over your life and over mine, so keep your head down and your hands up. Keep your head down and your hands up. Father, we thank you for your work on the cross in Jesus. We thank you for your word today, which affronts our pride and invites us to the grace of humility. Father, I thank you that we want to today recognize the pride in ourselves and also celebrate the humility in others. Give us the grace to do that today. And Holy Spirit, work with us in Jesus' name. Amen.